introduce our speaker, Teresa Arthur, and I am going to let her introduce herself because she was sharing with me beforehand, and I don't think I could come close to doing it the way that she did. Teresa. Thank you very much for introducing me. Um, first of all, I don't think anybody's going to have a problem hearing my voice. Um, I tend to have a relatively loud voice. Um, I work at University of Virginia. I have worked in clinical research for about 17 years now. Um, not all at University of Virginia. Prior to working there, I worked um, for what's called a contract research organization, and that's on really the sponsor side of studies, and I'll tell you a little bit about that as I get into my um, discussion with you all. Um, I am a clinical research coordinator. I love my job. It is extremely detailed, um, but my favorite part of the job is having to spend time with people. Um, so with that, um, I'm going to be talking today about clinical research programs. Um, primarily in interstitial lung disease, and then we also have a hyperpolarized gas imaging program. And so a lot of those are actually, I heard around the room, a number of you have COPD, so we have a physician that does quite a bit of COPD research. <coughs> so my first slide here, I just wanted to introduce our staff. Um, kind of our premier physician is Dr. Emery Noth. He is our division chief, and he has been at UVA just a little bit over a year now. He is a premier um, clinician, researcher, scientist, and he focuses quite a bit on genomics research. Um, he has a lot of NIH funding, and so really it's, it's looking at the genetics of what is going on with all of these various forms of ILD. And the hope is that one day, um, through his discoveries and collaborators' discoveries, we will be able to have more of a precision medicine approach for people with various forms of interstitial lung disease. And then under Dr. Noth, we have um, four primary ILD physicians, and each one of them focuses kind of in special areas. They all see people with all forms of ILD. Um, but we have Dr. Kathy Bonham, and she specializes in sarcoidosis. I think that's anybody here having sarcoidosis. Um, she is also a translational researcher, so she is in her lab a lot looking at specimens, Oops. specimens and um, trying to research um, kind of in that bench to bedside fashion. Um, we have Dr. Numan Malik, and he specializes in connective tissue disorders and autoimmune diseases. We have Hannah Manum, and she um, spends probably a good 50% of her time um, with people who need to have lung transplants. So she comes to our ILD clinic usually two to three afternoons a month, um, but spends <coughs> much of her time with people who need uh, lung transplants. We have Tessie Paul. She is um, very much involved with IPF and all other forms of interstitial lung disease. And are any of you involved with the Pulmonary Fibrosis Foundation Registry? You are, okay. So we are a Pulmonary Fibrosis Center of Excellence, and um, I think VCU maybe as well, I'm not sure. Um, but she is the director of our PFF Foundation, and she kind of oversees our support group that we have, which is similar to Breath Matters. Um, and then we have uh, Dr. Mike Shim, he is um, just a delightful, delightful physician. He has the best bedside manner, and um, he is very, very passionate about COPD and asthma as well. He does a lot of his own research. He has a lot of NIH funding for his studies, and um, he's always looking for something new. Um, he also is interested in lung cancer. Clinical research staff is myself, and then we have Kathy Brown, who's our nurse coordinator. She works very closely with the physicians, and she's a really, really good support for people coming in. She'll sit down and talk to you. Um, you can use her as a resource when you have questions about pulmonary fibrosis or any interstitial lung disease. We have Rose Love. She works primarily with Dr. Shim on his research studies. 
And then I have students. I have various students. Um, funding is always an issue with research. So I've got some UVA undergraduate students who are helping me. My, um, my student interns are due to start in June. And so they're um, aspiring medical students. And so they help with some of the less complex aspects. And then we have some research faculty. These are just our primary research faculty. We do have other people who do the, um, the laboratory work. Um, we have Dr. Shufan Ma, so she's a professor who came here with Dr. Mo from Chicago. We have Marie Burdick, who works primarily with Dr. Shim on his research. And then um, Keichi, which we just call her Peggy. Um, she works in the lab with Dr. Ma, doing a lot of the processing of these guys. And by all means, if you all have questions as I go along, interrupt me. I am very interruptible. So I wanted to kind of go into just some general information about clinical research. Um, so first question is, how many of you in this room have ever participated in research or know about clinical research? Okay, so just a few of you. Okay. Um, so there are a lot of reasons that clinical research is important. I've listed just a few of them. Um, but ultimately, without clinical research, doctors would really be guessing at the best ways to prevent doctors <coughs> treat diseases. Um, there have been so many breakthroughs in medicine through clinical research. So research really starts at that basic science level, um, you know, where people are literally in their labs doing research primarily with animals. Uh, we have a lot of mouse research, and that's where it starts. So people have an idea. They might have a compound of molecules that they're working on that they think might be effective for a certain disease. And so these brilliant scientists are in their labs testing on, like I said, most of the time it is on, on animals. And then if they find that those models are working, that's called preclinical research, they find that that's working, then they want to start testing it in humans. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about the phases of research um, that show you kind of how it progresses through. Um, so once they discover that something works in animals, we have um, our clinical research. And really, at the root of it, it's looking at certain diseases at a very in-depth level. Um, it's looking at people at a molecular level, and also um, looking at people's medical records, their progression of the disease, and really anything you can possibly imagine. So the research starts off with a study, and somebody thinks about a hypothesis, what they think is going to happen, and then they set out to either prove or disprove that hypothesis. Um, there are research studies that are negative. Um, even those negative studies um, have benefits. So I just wanted to give one example. Um, there was a the panther research study that was for people with IPF. And so prednisone, azathioprine, and NAP were three commonly used drugs for people with IPF. And this study set out to try to determine if that three combination package of medication worked better than one alone or placebo. So when you get into bigger trials, they always have like big drug placebo. Um, and so when 50% of the population had, you know, kind of gone through the trial, they did what's called an interim analysis. And they actually found that that three drug combination was harmful. It resulted in more hospitalizations and deaths than the placebo group. So although it didn't benefit, obviously, the participants who were in that study, it did tell the doctors, oh my gosh, we've been treating people incorrectly for these number of years. Um, and then essentially, you know, when you think about research and medications getting to the market, there are just volumes and volumes of data and information that need to be collected on people to know whether or not something is working. Um, and then I just have a couple of highlights of, you know, kind of some breakthrough things, right? So randomized clinical trial led to the approval of the first preventative treatment for polio. We all know that measles was nearly eliminated um, from vaccine, and that was from clinical trial. Deaths um, 
from childhood cancer have dr decreased dramatically over the years. There is a group called the Children's Oncology Group that is just relentless, absolutely relentless with research. And so a lot of children who were dying in the past are now living. And then also we had some pretty big impacts on coronary heart disease. Um, so pretty huge difference um, in heart disease being cut in half from 1980 to 2000. And so next I want to talk just a little bit about some common types of research studies. Um, we have registries, so you are in the PFF registry, is that correct? So a registry study is one in which um, information is collected and a lot of times they like to take samples from people, um, again to look at genetic research. Um, so registries usually don't take much additional time on your standard clinical care. So for the PFF registry, um, when people first enrolled in that study, they had one set of samples taken. And now every six months, we go in and look at the medical records so we can just kind of track and see how the people are doing, collect data, put it into a huge database with sites from you know, all over the country. And um, then when people come in for their standard of care visits, we ask them to complete these questionnaires that they complete each time. So it's like four or five questionnaires, um, just basic quality of life type questions. Um, there's also chart reviews, and those are similar to registries. Chart reviews a lot of times, though, are um, what's called investigator initiated. So it's a doctor at your institution wants to look at something very specific. So there's usually not funding for this. Um, and they might go in and look at, um, you know, how many people in the past 10 years who have, you know, come to our university have been on this blood pressure medication versus this blood pr pressure medication, and what are the difference in the outcomes? That would be a good example of like a retrospective chart review study. There are also observational studies, and those can be case studies, so it's just a couple of people, and they're looking just at those specific cases to try to learn things. Um, or they're looking at behavior in you know, the natural setting. We don't do a lot of observational studies, but that could be something like, you know, observing children um, at play to look at where they are developmentally and documenting, you know, what the differences might be in different groups of and so beyond that, we move into our <coughs> clinical trials. Um, so we have phase one, phase two and three, and phase four. The phase one is right after those animal models show us that, hey, we think this drug might actually work in human beings. And so the phase one trials are really not intended to benefit people. Um, the phase one trials, um, are often done in healthy participants with the goal of trying to figure out what the maximum tolerated dose of a medication is. But they are sometimes done in rare diseases or diseases that really have no cure. So I've, I've done some research with phase one trials of people with glioblastoma, which is um, a very deadly brain 